My name is Mason Marangella. I build rigs for the industry's top professionals. Now, I'm teaching guitarists how to build rigs like the pros, with DIY tips, easy mods, and all the tricks of the trade. I am the Rig Doctor. All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I'm just going to bring in our friends real quick here. We have some folks over on uh, Facebook, so I want to make sure we get them involved with this. Hello, friends at Facebook. If I'm looking up here, that means I'm looking at the Facebook folks. Just want to invite you all to our live stream today on YouTube. I'm going to reference up here every once in a while, but if you want the most interactive experience, I highly recommend that you come over to our YouTube channel, which is linked in the description right there, so that you can participate. We have some giveaways that are going to be going on today, so I'm going to be giving away various products, and I've talked about those if you're at all on our Instagram or <clears throat> on Facebook following us, you'll get a chance to see kind of some of those items. I kind of previewed them in, in some of the stories, so please make sure that you check those out uh, if you haven't already. And just to kind of give you a sneak preview of what they are, I got some uh, DC power cable uh, kits that uh, are from True Tone, so you can rewire your pedal board with these. We're going to be talking about these uh, today. I have a, a brand new Diodario True Bypass tuner. Uh, these are really great. I really love how big the screen is on here, so you can really see how you're tuning. I also, from Chalks, have an AC rider, and this is a really good kind of does some high current AC stuff and DC stuff, so you have a kind of a mixture of stuff you want to add that on. I also have a brand new Mogami 2524 with uh, Neutrik ends, gold Neutrik ends, so the, the more expensive ones. And then I have two different interfaces. I have the one that you've probably seen on the YouTube channel, which is our uh, uh, one for effects loop, so it allows you to go between the effects loop and the front of the amp, just depending on how you plug in on the outside of it, and you can just leave all your effects loop stuff plugged in in the same place on your pedal board. And they also have this custom one, and you notice that this one's actually unlabeled, because I was going to give this one away as the very last item, which uh, I will route for you however you want. So if you want a stereo one, I'll make it for stereo. If you want an effects loop one, I'll do it for effects loop. You can do whatever fancy stuff you want it to do, as long as it doesn't exceed this number of jacks, I can do it for you. So there's lots of different options on how that's going to go. And so I highly recommend that you hang out, you stay and watch. I'm going to basically be giving you an overhaul of all the possible things that you could do with some of your downtime here, easy improvements that you can make, and I'll try to give you as much of a variety of price points as possible and try to keep uh, you know, the, the cheap options as high quality as possible so you're not sacrificing much by, say, going to a, a cheaper, less expensive version of everything. So... I appreciate that, and I appreciate all the birthday wishes. Today is my birthday. I'm 35 years old. I was born this day, 1985, uh, in Oakland, California. And uh, so let's uh, let's get into it. So today, most of the things that I'm going to be talking about, in fact, all the things I'm going to be talking about are available uh, at our friends at Sweetwater. And if you're not aware of what Sweetwater is, it is certainly one of the, the very best dealerships in the country and we're very fortunate that we manufacture pedals that they sell there and some of you who are coming to us for the first time actually maybe don't even know that we you know first and foremost I'm a pedal manufacturer and then this is something that I do as a, as a hobby and for enrichment and things like that on YouTube but uh, Sweetwater is a fantastic place and I've been doing a lot of uh, stuff with them video wise to kind of give some enrichment and so today we're going to be talking about a lot of products that they sell and if you're not familiar with Sweetwater, they have a, a great list of sales engineers. And these are sort of like curators that will help you pick out your gear and give you the best recommendations. And in fact, I train a lot of the sales engineers here. So a lot of them have the very same training that I have in terms of understanding things like buffers, power supplies, the best stuff to get. So I highly recommend that if you don't have a sales engineer at Sweetwater, somebody who's kind of like your point person there, I highly recommend you do. This is my sales engineer, Todd Cotton. Very good guy. Look at that handsome man. He does just a great job of, if there's stuff I don't know about, like sometimes when I try to get in some of the pro audio stuff or I need to buy a Universal Audio uh, Apollo or something like that, he knows all that information and, and is really, really highly trained. Even to become a sales engineer, you need to have months and months of training. They have their own university on campus. They actually make all the new recruits go through so that they all have this really high baseline. So I highly recommend you check them out if you haven't done that already. I'm going to have a link 
to all the places on Sweetwater where they have everything that we're talking about today. So I highly recommend that you check that out. So I want to start with one of the easiest things of the day, just for an easy at-home improvement. Uh, it's none other than what I call Deoxit. Uh, well, I don't call it Deoxit, but the company that makes it is, calls it Deoxit. So this is Deoxit. And Deoxit D5 is a contact cleaner. Now, you know, some people get really confused a lot of times when they see contact cleaner and they think it's the same as WD-40 or that all contact cleaners are created equal, and they actually aren't. Deoxid does two things which most contact cleaners don't do. It cleans the contacts, which is, is in the name itself, but the other thing that it does that's really valuable is it actually protects like your input jacks, your output jacks, your DC power connectors. You can literally spray it on any part of your pedal without any risk. So you can plug it, you, you spray it in the input jack, you can spray it in the DC power jack on the back of your pedal or wherever it happens to be located, your output jack you can use on your guitar. It really works on everything and you can be pretty liberal with it and not have much of a problem. But the one thing I noticed that people don't do with it after they spray it is it's a good idea to take the male end of the jack and then insert it into the female end of the jack and work it through a few times. I know that everybody's laughing right now because it's, you know, there's some innuendo in there. But in seriousness, it's the best way to make sure that it really gets clean and that you work the contact cleaner into the contacts. And it really cleans them and not just cleans them, but also protects them. Some of the other contact cleaners can have a very temporary fix. And I found the Deoxid actually has very lasting uh, effects. And if you do this to your pedal board, say, once a year. It's just a really good thing to do to it to keep it maintained. Just unplug all your cables, spray this in all the jacks, all the contacts, work your jacks in a few times, and then it's really going to make sure that your uh, your pedal board is really up and running and going to do a great job for you and be reliable for you for many years to come. If you look at the uh, this video here, which is called the uh, Pedal Board Toolbox Essentials on our channel, you can actually see exactly a demonstration of how I do that. But gosh, this is a really cheap $14.95, a really cheap, easy way to just make sure that your, your pedals are, are optimally functioning. This will even work in like dirty pots. Uh, you know, if you have a wah-wah and it has that kind of scratchy sound, you can actually spray this in the pot or in your volume pedal, and this will actually remediate a lot of those problems. A lot of times we think we have a failure uh, when really all we need to do is just hit it with some contact cleaner. And it's a really easy way to, to get it nice and clean. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is uh, well, one of the things I talk about all the time, which is the 3M Dual Lock. Now, we use this all over our pedal boards, but a lot of people are still using the old school, archaic Dual Lock that you found on, you know, whatever your provided pedal board is. And Dual Lock is really, really heavy duty. In fact, most Dual Lock is rated for about five pounds per square inch. So if you're using, let's say, about six inches of Dual Lock per pedal, you have quite a bit of force that's needed in order to remove it. So if you're considering something to do with your downtime here, if you're in a shelter in place or whatever the, the condition may be in your particular locality, this is a really easy way to make sure that you're, you're, all your pedals are going to be in place exactly where you left them. And it's not going to be one of those situations where you open up the case and you find your pedals are just spilled everywhere in the case. That's definitely happened to me when I was a rookie in the game, you know, in, in high school and, and put my full tone, full drive one, which was like a huge expense for me back then. Uh, and then I find it like, you know, flopping around. I had one of those old SKB uh, cases that the power supply built in. It was really noisy and and uh, but anyway this completely eliminates that problem if you're using this even if you're just using it on the pedal side and then you want to use the standard kind of carpet on the bottom it actually even holds great in that condition as well you don't necessarily have to use another mated side of dual lock and you can see here from Sweetwater they actually uh, theirs is listed as an Emerson custom version I think that just Emerson custom is providing it to them it is still made by 3M and I actually like here that they've cut it into a half inch section because sometimes using a full uh, inch thick of, uh, of dual lock can sometimes be more than you need for most pedals, especially some of the smaller kind of MXR size stuff. And again, I have a, a video here where I show exactly the technique on how I do that and how to best put the dual lock and maybe a few little tips that maybe you didn't consider when you're uh, adding some sort of adhesive uh, you know, hook and loop system to your, your pedal board. So that's that's some dual lock Velcro. Let's uh, get into uh, some power supplies because this is another one that a lot of us are getting into. But before I get into this, I want to do the first component to our giveaway. So we're going to start nice and easy. What I'm going to offer first is a fully loaded bag of brand new DC power cables. I figure this is a good time since we're going to get into 
using power supplies in just a moment. What I want to do, the way that this game is going to work, is I'm going to ask you in a moment a question about power supplies. And for people that have been watching our videos regularly, this should be a very easy question for you to answer. So the first person that answered this correctly in the comments, Mason Mejia is going to reach out to you. He's going to comment back. He's going to give you uh, his email address. You're going to hit him up with an email and claim your prize, and we will make sure that we get this to you this week. So the first question that I want to, you to answer, and this is going to be anybody who can answer this in the comments, first person to press enter and have it correct is going to win this. I want to know what are five isolated power supplies that I recommend? What are five isolated power supplies that I recommend? It could be any of the five that I've talked about. You put that in the comments below right now. First person that answers that has all five recommended isolated power supplies is going to win a free new, this has got like 15 power cables in it and a bunch of adapters. I'm going to send that to you free of charge. No matter where you live in the world, I will send this to you. So go ahead and do that and we're going to move into, uh, okay, don't answer here. Mejia is saying answer in the comments. So answer in the comments section. So not in the live stream. So answer in the comments section. <clears throat> All right, let's, uh, let's move on to some power supplies now. So, you know, one of the cheapest power supplies that I always think is amazing, I think is amazing, amazing, is the, tr or the True Tone CS7. I mean, it just is kind of a, a, a cheap one that, uh, I mean, relatively, uh, you know, regarding like all the different power supplies that are out there. This one is definitely for isolated, one of the best value ones out there. You have the True Tone CS7, incredibly, incredible, credible value. It is a switching supply, so that means it's not going to be sensitive to a lot of the standard things that happen with power supplies where you have noise if you get the pedal too close to the transformer, things like that. Even the high quality ones that we all know and love, like the Voodoo Lab Pedal Power 2, although it's great in a lot of conditions, you still need to be careful about where you put pedals in relationship to that because the transformer can start to create some oscillation, some noise with certain digital pedals. So I really like as an entry level, I really like the CS7. Another one that's similar to the CS7 that I also think is really good is the, what's that one called? The RS300, kind of a similar size one. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's really quiet, nice isolated power supply, really, really good quality. The other one that I also like is, is also made by True Tone, which is the CS6. Let's see if I can find that one. Do I have this one on here? I might not have that one on there, but it's a very similar size to this one. And then, of course, if you go for the bigger things, there's the True Tone CS12, the Big Daddy. This one I think is great because it's like, you know, as big as a pedal power Mondo, essentially, in terms of what it will power, but it's switching, it's much lighter weight, and it can work at any voltage in the world. That's the one thing I want to make clear about all the pedals or power supplies I've mentioned here. You can use them anywhere in the world, and you have to make no calibration whatsoever. On the CS12, the only difference is, is on the back, there's, an, there's a switch for the AC side of things because there's a 9-volt AC out, and it has a dedicated transformer for that. And then it just switches between 220 and 120. But other than that, all the other outputs will automatically switch. So if you don't have anything plugged into that AC side, you don't need to worry about it at all. So that's really cool. And then, of course, if you really want to splurge, I really, of course, love the Strymon Zuma. I think that the Strymon Zuma and the, the CS12 are, are really pretty equally matched. It kind of just depends on whether you need all the voltage characteristics that are with the CS12 because the CS12 has some 18 volt ones, has some 12 volt ones, a lot more that are switchable than on the Zuma. I think the Zuma only has two switchable, which are the last two between 12 and 9 and 18. Uh, the upside though of the Zuma is that every output is 500 milliamps, so that is a cool thing if you have a lot of high powered stuff. But the one kind of sleeper power supply I wanted to tell you about, which I really love, and a lot of people aren't talking about, I'm not really sure why, is actually made by Voodoo Lab. And this is actually a switching power supply as well. It's kind of their first uh, foray into the switching power supply, which is called the X4. And this is $79. This is like incredibly, incredibly cheap. And the cool thing about it is that it only takes a 12 volt input and it only needs to be at half an amp. So let's say, for example, you had something, I don't know, like the CS12, or you had something like the Zuma, you wouldn't necessarily have to go and buy another Strymon and another True Tone. All you need to do is take one of those 12-volt outputs 
and then you can feed it into the input, which is all the way there on the right-hand side of the Voodoo Lab X4 expander with just a standard power cable, and then it gives you four more isolated outputs. So it's a good way if you need to expand upon your pedal board, you want to add a few more pedals during this time off that you have, some downtime that you have at home, you can expand it and it's 80 bucks, and that is a super quiet supply. I mean, incredible supply, and it's tiny. It's really, really little. So this might be a good alternative if you were thinking about maybe going with an Ohi, which is the Strymon equivalent. This is 79 bucks, man. That is so cheap, and it's high, high quality, all made here in California. So I really, really appreciate that supply if you want a, seat, a sleeper supply. Okay, now I'm going to give away. I think Mejia has probably already assigned this one to somebody, so I'm going to take this one off the table. But I do have one more. I have another one that is the same one. I have a little bit smaller bag on this one. But I'm going to do another giveaway right now, since we've, we're talking about power supply still, so I want to keep this in the power supply range. I want to know one benefit. This is for people who have been watching these videos a lot. They're going to know this a lot, a lot, more, a lot more quickly than some of you who haven't. But I want you all to give, give this a try. I want to know what is the primary benefit to using, I only need one benefit, of using a switching power supply versus a linear power supply. What is the benefit of using a switching power supply versus a linear power supply? Both are isolated, but what is the benefit of using a switching supply? I want you to tell me one benefit, first person to answer correctly will win. So that's going to go to the side. So go ahead and answer that in the comments. And you can answer right here. Mason Mejia has changed his, his tune on this. Mason Mejia is one of the other vertexers with me but he's here in the comments helping me manage remotely since we're all working from home during this time so go ahead and put that in the comments first person to answer correctly gets it so let's move on um oh and, oh and i should mention on the power supplies i do have one video about maximizing your power supply and this is a really good one if you kind of want to know a few more of the distinctions around differences in power supplies why you might want to choose one over the other things like that Really, really helpful video to watch if you haven't watched already. This one's got, you know, 50K. It was kind of a slow grower, but I think a lot of people still refer to this. And actually tomorrow I'm going to be coming out with a video about how to make your own DC power cables to do all the voltage doubling, the current doubling, uh, splitters, 18 volt stuff, 24 volts, all that stuff. So check out that video that's going to be coming out tomorrow. I'm going to show you how to do all that stuff and diagrams and all the good stuff. Let's move on to uh, the TC buffers let's move on to some buffers so i talk about buffers all the time but i have to say this one it blows me away uh if you are not if you are not one of the people that have watched some of our buffer videos like uh like this one here where not all buffers are created equal um the bona fide buffer man is such a good deal it's 69.99 it, is, it meets all the criteria that I've set for, for quality input and output impedance. I think that there's some, there's some exceptions to this, but typically one meg input is what you want. So the input impedance is one meg. The output impedance is somewhere between 80 and about 150 ohms. Make sure it doesn't say K after that. So it should be 100 or 80 to about 150 ohms. This meets that criteria perfectly and it's 69 bucks. Now, you do need two. You really should have one on the input and on the output. But even at that, even if you bought two of these, I bet your Sweetwater sales engineer might grant you a deal if you were buying two of them. And gosh, they're so cheap. You can put one in their small, one in the beginning, one at the end. Now, if you didn't like TC, you had something against them, another great alternative that's very similar to this, a little more expensive, is the Mesa Boogie Stowaway. Now, this is all made in the USA. This is a very high quality one. This is also one where you could do a high quality input output buffer and just put that right underneath your pedal board. Now, Mesa Boogie has kind of made these two different ones where they've designated the stowaway as being an input buffer where you'd use that first and then they have this one that you're supposed to connect it to which they're calling the output section which is called the clear link. So this one is, is a little bit different system where you buy two different ones but in all honesty, I've used two stowaways in certain conditions, the, the $99 one, and it's been fine. So you don't necessarily need to connect it to the clear link if you don't want to spend that extra cash. It's another 30 bucks. You could still get away just like by if you were buying two of the TC electronic versions, this one right here. You could also just as easily get away with buying two stowaways and be able to get away with that. Now, if you wanted to upgrade and go to the, the granddaddy of all these, then of course you get the, the high wire. 
This one's 219, and this is a great upgrade to make to your rig with some downtime because it has the two buffers already built in. It's got a boost built in, which is at the end of the signal path. And you can patch these two buffers in whichever way you want. Now, typically, most people are going to plug right into the high wire. They're going to go through their pedals. They're going to come back into the high wire to get that output buffer, and then it's going to go out to their amp. There's also a tuner mute uh, on that and a boost again built in. And then it has a level compensation for different types of pickups. So it has like a humbucker setting, which uh, pads down the output a few dB, and then a single coil setting where it bumps it up a few so that you can kind of e easily match your, uh, your different instruments with this thing. And I think it's a really great value. Sweetwater sales engineers know this thing inside out. I've given a lot of dedicated training on the differentiated buffers and all those are really great fits for pretty much any rig. I mean, unless you have a fuzz face or some sort of impedance sensitive fuzz, you're gonna need an input buffer and you're gonna need an output buffer. If you've got more than a couple pedals, it doesn't matter. You wanna make sure that you're maintaining the integrity of the signal as much as possible and having that dual buffer system, one in the beginning, one at the end, is really gonna be imperative if you want that sound of just plugging directly into your amp with no pedals in between. So that is buffers and again, I have a really good video about this called The Truth About Buffers, Not All Buffers Are Created Equal. You can check that guy out on our YouTube channel. So please do that if you haven't already. Let's move on to uh, patch cables, this is a good one. So there's a bunch of, of pre-made patch cables. Most of them are terrible. <laughs> and, and, and I hate to say that because I think most of the guys that are making patch cables are typically not cable manufacturers. Like the really cool boutique cable manufacturers, they're not, they're not selling tons and tons of cables typically. And sometimes they're forced into going solderless because that's a, a market trend right now that a lot of people like. But even a lot of the companies that I know that manufacture solderless cables, they would prefer not to sell them, but they're kind of forced to because the industry right now is demanding that. But I'm going to recommend some high quality soldered cables for you at a couple different price points. And there's actually one sleeper in there that I think is an incredible deal for what it is. So first of all, let's start with the, the less expensive version, the MXR um, patch cables. You get a couple of them in there. And I think there's even some different sizes that you can choose from within this. So you don't necessarily need to choose the six inch. I think there's a couple of different varieties. This is a pretty great deal at $12.99 because typically these plugs are at least, you know, maybe a dollar, dollar fifty each if you're buying it in small quantities like that. I'm not sure exactly the cable that they're using, but it, it seems to be pretty close to kind of a Mogami type cable. Maybe they are using Mogami, I'm not sure. But it definitely is very well built. And for $12.99, it's certainly going to be a more reliable option than any of the solderless varieties. It's going to be much more bulletproof. You always want to have a gas tight connection. I've talked about this ad nauseum. You can watch my video about patch cables for pedal boards, and we talk about this to a degree. We also give some soldering tips, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Another one that I think is 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 pretty cool, and this one is, I think is 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 a sleeper deal. Twelve ninety five. Now I know this is a little bit more expensive. It's one six inch patch cable, but this comes with a Neutrik connector. These Neutrik connectors can be up to like four or five dollars just for the connector plus you get a mogami 2319 cable in between there and it's for 12.95 i think that that's actually a really great deal because you're basically almost paying cost for those connectors and then a couple bucks above cost certainly for the cable but man that's a really good deal for a high quality neutric ends like that now they might be a little bulky for a pedal board so if you if you are really cramped for space that might not be a good alternative for you but in terms of the quality like that thing is going to last you forever you're never ever going to have to replace that um another good one that i like is the diadario american stage cable and i actually also like these as instrument cables they make instrument cable versions of these that are very inexpensive this is a little bit on the more expensive side at 26.99 but again, a very good sounding cable, really high quality plugs. Neutrik made this plug for Diodario, so they have like their own custom version of a Neutrik plug. And if you're not familiar with Neutrik, it's, they're made in Liechtenstein and they're a very, very high quality connector company. And they make all sorts of connectors for guitars and a lot of different uh, audio and video uh, type applications. And then of course, I'm gonna give you the cheapest option. If you wanna do a little DIY work, they do sell Mogami 2524 by the foot, which is a high quality instrument cable. And then you can also get, you know, different types of plugs like the Switchcraft 229, which is a really high quality, low profile pancake connector. We also have the 226, which is the right angle connector. And then the 280, which is the kind of the one that everybody knows, the standard straight Switchcraft end. And then there's the mini straights, which are good if you're using a programmable switcher or something like that. You need something really low profile. 
And again, I have given you a video here called Patch Cables for Pedal Boards. If you check this out, I give a very detailed description of how to solder different types of patch cables, give very detailed instructions on exactly what to do. So please be sure to watch that. You can save quite a bit of money if you're willing to make it yourself because you can figure here if, if you're talking about a dollar a foot, most of your patch cables are going to be under a foot. So you're you're talking about maybe you know eight dollars a cable, something like that, if you make them themselves. Uh, make them yourselves. The only one that would potentially be cheaper than that would be the MXR Premade, where you get three at twelve ninety nine. But I don't think that they're using Switchcraft ends. I think they're using a Switchcraft equivalent. That's kind of like an overseas knockoff of it. So not quite the same. And we don't know if they're using Mogami or if they're using some other type of brand. I'm not sure. But uh, if you wanted to do it yourself, I'll ha I have all the resources here for you. Um, so please be sure to check out those videos if you haven't. I think that it's time for another giveaway. So let's do the tuner, the Diodario tuner, brand new true bypass tuner. This is a good time for a giveaway, I think. So this is the question that I'm going to ask you this time. Because we talked a little bit about buffers, I want you to give me in the comments, I want you to tell me why it's important that you have two buffers and where they need to go in the signal path. Where do those two buffers need to go? Where do you want to keep those two buffers? I always talk about the buffers, but where do they need to go in the signal path? Why is it important to have two buffers? Answer me that in the comments below. First person that answers gets this Diodario tuner. I will ship it anywhere in the world for the first person that answers this correctly. Diodario tuner, go. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to, oh, this is a great one. Okay, this is a really short one, a uh, really short one. So a lot of people will ask me a lot of times about noise issues that they're having on their pedal board. And, and I, I do have a really good video about troubleshooting noise. It's, uh, let's see, where's that one? Right here. Uh, I did this one actually with Rhett Schull. And uh, Rhett was having some noise issues with his, or he was having some, some troubleshooting issues with his rig. He was taking it to the UK, something got disheveled. But I talk a lot about troubleshooting, not just with his rig, but in rigs in general. But one great troubleshooting tool, which is actually important if you're running stereo, if you're running splitters, that a lot of people sleep on, uh, is this product right here from Laylee called the P-Split. Now, uh, th this is a pretty expensive one. There's actually an alternative to this that's made by Radial. Uh, and I didn't remember the model name, but I'm sure that if you said to your Sweetwater sales engineer, you called Sweetwater, and talk to your sales engineer, or emailed them, they would know what that alternative is. But it, and I think the radio one's maybe more like $100. So it's, a, it's a little bit less. But this is great if you don't have an isolation transformer and you're running a stereo setup and you want to make sure that you get the polarity inversion option, you get the ability to be able to lift the ground, you have an isolation transformer so you don't need to worry about that second amp creating any sort of noise or a ground loop. This is a super easy thing to install, insert under a pedal, almost use it like a riser because it is very low sitting on a pedal board. You can just kind of put something right on top of that and it just fits just like, you know, you have like a, maybe a really flat, low profile interface that you're setting in on top of. So I highly recommend checking out the P-Splitter if you haven't already. It is a lifesaver. We use them all the time when we're, you know, splitting out to different amps when we're in the, the Vertex headquarters studio where we have an isolation room for amps. Sometimes when we're running stuff and running long lines in there, we need to use that in order to create um, some isolation. So this is a really, really valuable tool. If you're experiencing any sort of noise issues, you're trying to troubleshoot something, or you got a stereo set up, and you sometimes have conditions where you're getting noise out of that second amp, using one of these will absolutely kill it, and it's totally passive. You just need to make sure that it's coming after a decent quality buffer, a pedal that has a low enough impedance to really drive it. They say that it can drive every, everything at pretty much any high or low impedance. I haven't experienced it not being able to drive something. In what you'd hear maybe would be some distortion or some coloration if it wasn't meeting that standard. But I haven't been able to put it into condition where it didn't do that so, or, or where, it, where I experienced that. So it's very high quality. I think something you should definitely check out if you're experiencing any sort of noise issues, any concern around that. Uh, let's go over to... Let's go over to, so we did patch cables, we did power supplies. Let's go over to uh, instrument cables. Let's, let's finish out with instrument cables. And this will be good because I'm going to be giving away an instrument cable. So, you know, at, at Sweetwater, they have some really, really great instrument cables. But really, you know, I think that the, that the move is really just about getting, you know, the Mogami 2524 and then going ahead and then pairing it with something like this Neutrik, uh, which is what I have here. 
Now they have versions of this that are already pre-made for you. They're about $50. And the thing I'd say about instrument cables is if you're going to invest in them, if you're going to invest money in instrument cables, the one to invest in is the first one, the one that goes from your guitar into your pedal board. Because that's the place where there isn't going to be any buffering occurring unless you have active pickups or some sort of preamp, which most of you probably will not. And that's where the pickups and everything is going to be completely seen by the guitar. And that's the one where you really are going to be able to change the tone the most depending on what instrument cable you use. Because once you go into one of the high quality buffers that I talked about on here, you know, whether you're getting the $69 TC Electronic or you're getting the $220 Mesa Boogie, from that point forward, assuming that you're using decent quality cables on the board, you know, just like, you know, Mogami 2319, that's like, you know, 40 cents a foot or something like that, if you were to use that, or, you know, fill in the blank type of, you know, standard cable that you would use on a pedal board for patch cables. After that buffer, those are going to have, you know, very little difference. You know, a lot of that capacitance is going to be presumably erased, you know, presuming that you use high quality buffers like I've talked about. But what isn't going to be buffered at all is that first cable that's going into the system. So if you start messing around with using cables that have different EQs, things like that, you're actually going to be able to get a variety of different tones. So from Sweetwater, you know, of course they sell Mogami. That's usually my go-to. But sometimes it's nice to have a couple of other flavors in there if you want to mess around with maybe having one cable that's a little bit brighter. Uh, one that, that Sweetwater sells that I really like is made by Astrope. And uh, if you check out my Sweetwater video that I did with them about five pedal board upgrades uh, you know, that was published a few weeks ago, they show that Astro cable. For some reason, my slide for Astro, I can't get it to come up, so I'm not sure what happened here. But in any case, that Astro cable is really, really nice. It's, it's actually made by Fishman, but Astro is kind of its own division of Fishman. Really, really great high quality cable. Guys like Dave Grissom use it. Um, you know, David Grissom, who's got uh, that signature PRS guitar, the DGT. That's a really great one. And then if you want something that's kind of really fat, one that Sweetwater sells that I really love is, is the Lava Soar. And the cool thing that, like this Mogami 2524, you can also buy the Lava Soar in bulk um, from Sweetwater, and then you can terminate it with your own ends here, with the uh, Neutrik ends. And they also have right angle versions of this. And again, I have given you a video where I show about how to you know, solder cables just like this. So if you wanted to give it a try, maybe just try buying 10 feet and buying two connectors and seeing if you're able to do it yourself because man once you learn this skill and you got it down you learn to fish on this stuff you know you'll never have to buy any expensive cables again you can just buy the raw materials and you can do it yourself so to summarize I really like Mogami if you're gonna spend money spend it on that very first cable that goes from the guitar into the amplifier that's really the one you want to spend money on the ones I really like are the Mogami 2524 like the one here I also really like the Astroope one, which is made by Fishman. That's also something available at Sweetwater. And then the other one is the Lava Soar. Really, really good. Has a nice, fat, kind of low-end thing that I really dig. It attenuates the highs a little bit, but sometimes that can be a thing that you want, depending on what kind of instrument you have. You have a Telecaster, super bright. You might want to kind of cut off some of those top end, uh, those really high highs. And you maybe don't want to use a coily cable to try to tame that down. You know, so that could be a, a really nice way to do it to get some of that fatness. So basically, you're kind of using that first cable almost like a like an EQ, like a pre-EQ before it goes into that entire, entire pedal board. Because we have to remember that cables are basically like filters. You know, when we talk about cables, we talk about capacitance. And if we think of it, the root word of capacitance, it's capacitor, right? So it's basically like you're choosing a capacitor, in essence, just like when you choose capacitors on your guitars, on your tone controls, and your volume controls. It makes them react differently. It can roll things off differently. And our cables are doing that very same thing. They're a filter for the entire pedal board. So that first cable is the filter that actually influences everything else that comes after that. So that's the one you really want to invest in. After all those buffers, just using something that's really high quality, shielded, and as low as capacitance as you can get for the budget is going to be fine. But that first cable is going to have a big impact. So if you're going to spend your money on one cable, that's the place that I would do it and keep it as short as you presumably could. You know, 10 feet is probably an ideal uh, length. Some people, you know, they may need to go on the ego ramp, you know, on the rock concerts, and they need to have a 50-foot cable. It probably isn't going to sound as good as a 10-foot, but, uh, you know, as short as you can get away with uh, in your situation is good. So, again, to wrap up, all of these different items, they are available from our good friends at Sweetwater. Again, if you don't have a sales engineer, there are plenty of great sales engineers like my good buddy Todd Cotton. He's a guy that can help you. 
get this stuff together, but Todd is just mine, but everybody can get their own sales engineer when they go to the Sweetwater website. What I recommend that you do is you go to their contact page right here and you can fill out this information so that you can go and visit your sales engineer, your, you know, get a sales engineer assigned to you if you don't have one already and they will assign one to you who's an expert in kind of the field that you're interested in. So if you're a guitar player, you're most likely gonna get somebody who's more oriented toward the types of things and interests that you're into. But I have to say they are very highly trained, very, very effective, and they can elaborate even further on a lot of the stuff that I've done. And of course, if you have questions about anything that I've said, I will clarify all those things. My main intent here is to give you a really easy, reliable resource that is gonna be able to get this stuff to you reliably that you can then go ahead and get and then take it home, do these things at home. While you have some extra time on your hands, you can organize your pedal board, get it cleaned up, put some new power cables on there, put some new instrument and patch cables on there, clean up all your pedals. So let's go to the next part. I'm gonna be giving away this 2524 gold nitric ends, right to straight, 10 feet. This would be a perfect cable to in fact use from your guitar into your pedal board. So one thing, this is the question I wanna ask and then you're gonna answer in the comments below. Okay, so I'm gonna ask this question, you're gonna put your answer in the comments. I wanna know, I'm just trying to think of a good question here for you. People have been watching this a lot. Okay. I wanna know, why is it so important to spend your money on the very first cable, the one going from your guitar into the pedal board instead of the other cables that are on your pedal board? Why is it most important to have the cable of your choice, the one that you want to color the tone the most as the first cable? Why is that important? Put that in the comments below. First person to answer with the correct-ish answer will win this cable. I will ship it wherever you are in the world. All right. And, oh wait, now I forgot. I have this Chox AC Rider. So I'll give this one away in a little bit. And then of course I still also have our two interfaces that I'm gonna give, be giving away again. This is the effects loop one that I built on the channel uh, last week. And then I have this custom one, which I will wire however you want me to wire. So we're going to be giving these away in a little bit, but let's go through. I feel like we've done a good job of, of kind of taking it through some of the, the stuff available at Sweetwater. So I hope you guys check those out. I've linked all that in the description, but let's go through. Let's, uh, let's take some questions here. I know that there's a lot here cause we've been kind of going, going back and forth, but, um, let's see, uh, let's see if we got any, any stuff coming through here that I can help answer. All right, so this is from Dan of NJ. He's saying, hey Mason, show us the board. Uh, I think he probably means our new pedal board. For a lot of you who have um, who've been following us know that we're coming out with a series of new pedal boards. And uh, about four or five different sizes that are complementary to Pelican um, air cases, SKB molded cases things like that. So what I have, let's... so this is one of them. This is, this is the, the most, one of the more travelable ones. This is 10 inches by 20 inches. And it has some holes punched in it up here because this is going to be made to fit all the different riser possibilities that can go on into it for the hinged risers. But I mean, the, the, the bottom is using really, really high quality heavy duty feet and they're actually bolted in to the board and it's the same thickness as our normal pedal boards that we'd be using but on this particular one that i'm going to be doing it's kind of a john mayer inspired pedal board and so it's going to be using a an hx effects on here it's going to be using a vintage ts10 um, some Quan clones some of the ultraphonics and steel string on here and then another cool product which I really recommend that I'm super impressed with is the Morningstar ML5. And this is basically like, imagine a programmable looper, like any sort of switcher, except it's just the loop part. And then you can take the MIDI out and then go into a MIDI device to actually control all these loops. So, you, so I'm basically gonna be using, in essence, if you can imagine, I'll have my HX effects, which is this guy which has on the back a MIDI out. So MIDI out from that is gonna go into MIDI in of this. 
and then I can put five pedals in these five loops and then control it with this. So this essentially becomes my true bypass loop switcher, but the loops are wired into this. So it's a really hip way to use like a MIDI device like this to kind of serve a double function. So I'm able to basically program all my pedals through that, plus use all of the effects built into the Line 6 HX effects. And I can use them before the pedals or after the pedals because I'm actually going to loop that ML5 into a send and return loop in the Line 6 HX effects itself. So pretty cool stuff. It's going to be like a John Mayer SRV kind of style inspired rig, which is definitely tones that I love and use a lot. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's a, I think it's a good time to, to now go for the uh, AC rider. So next thing I'm giving away, AC rider. And again, I will ship anywhere in the world, whoever wins this. So AC rider is very cool, made by Chalks, really high quality power supply. Now this isn't a switching supply, this is a linear supply but it needs to be because it's doing AC. But the cool thing is it has a little switch right here so you can switch back and forth between whatever your input voltage is in your country of origin. So it makes that pretty handy and easy to use. So the question I have for you now, because we've already asked a question about the power supply, but one thing I've asked some of you is some of the DC power cables that we get, because we talked about this a little bit, DC power cables, in fact, let me just give you a quick little tutorial on this and then I'll ask my question. So on DC power cables, let me bring some up. I have some of those here. DC power cables like this, these are the ones provided by Voodoo Lab. Voodoo Lab makes a shielded power cable. However, a lot of the power cables that are out there are not shielded. They're basically just two conductors that have no shielding around them. I want you to tell me in the comments, what is the advantage of using a shielded DC power cable over just two center conductors, one dedicated to the hot, one dedicated to the ground? What is the advantage of using shielded DC power cables? Whoever answers that first will win a Chox AC rider. I will ship it anywhere in the world. All right, so while people are answering that, Let's get into some more questions. So you can answer that in the comments below. First person to answer wins. All right. All right. I've got a bunch of different stuff here. Let's see. All right, uh, this is a power supply question. This is from Mario Arnold. It says, can you use the expander with a good lab pedal power? Do I think it means Voodoo Lab? Sure, you can use it. I, I think the only challenge is with, and he's talking about this expander that we brought up here, the X4. And you can, I think you just need to make sure that you're using one of those higher current outputs, like five or six, or you may need to parallel five and six, so that you can, or a current doubler, and so you can get the 500 to then go in that 12 volt in, and then you'll have four more outputs. So that could be a way to utilize it with it. The other thing you could do is you could use the courtesy out on the pedal power two, because on the back of the pedal power two, there's like a regular kind of wall plug. And then you could plug a 12 volt power supply, like a wall board into there, and then route it into the input of the, uh, of the, of the X4 would be another way to get around that for the pedal power two. Um, let's see. Say more, some more questions. Oh, this is also from Mario. My Empress Buffer Plus makes a slight noise. Is that normal? Well, I guess I, my question is, what is the noise? And does it happen if you just use your guitar into it and then a cable out of it to your amp and just bypass your pedal board? In other words, how are you identifying that it's the culprit of your noise? Could it be that there's something else you're connecting it to that is giving you the noise and you're just perceiving or some placing blame on that particular device. Is that possible? Maybe not. Um, oh, this is a good one. A lot of people actually brought this up. 
So Matt says, my Empress buffer that you've recommended in the past has an output impedance of 510 ohms, uh, not 80 to 150. So this was my mistake. I looked at the stereo buffer, and actually the stereo Empress buffer has a different specification than the mono versions of the buffer. And I think I just looked at what the stereo buffer output impedance was and then assume that it would be the same buffer across the other models. It turns out that that is not true. Now, 510 isn't like terrible, terrible. It's just not in the ideal range. I would say that like if, if 80 to 150 is an A, this is kind of like a B. But most of them are like 1K, like, like a boss buffer is 1K output, or a lot of the buffers that you see that people sell are 1K, which is really too high uh, to really be an effective line driver. Like you might like how it sounds, but it's not going to sound the same as your guitar plugged directly into your amp. There's going to be a lot of artifacts that are imparted to the tone that weren't there before just by way of using something like that. So thank you, Matt, for that clarification. I will make sure that we clean that up in the uh, future recommendations. Um, but again, I think that something like the the Mesa Boogie is a great one. I gave you a couple more that I added that I actually didn't have in that original list. Things like the, um, where is that one? The TC Bonafide wasn't on the original one. Also, the Stowaway was not there. So those are other alternatives if you kind of wanted to get kind of a, a, a less expensive version. Those could be things that you could choose, but you would again need to buy two of them. So I think it's still maybe slightly more than the Empress. I think the Empress is around low hundreds, something like that. So it's maybe in that range, but maybe a little over. So um, thank you for that clarification. I will make sure that, that gets fixed. Um, let's see, Artie Dillon, will you need another set of buffers if you're running for cable method? You won't need another set, but you'll need three. So if you're running for cable method, what he means by that is like sort of the system that I have here. So you have your guitar coming in, that's cable one. You have send going to the uh, effects loop send is coming in and then return going back to the amplifier. And then you have your amplifier. So you have one, two, three, four cables, four cable method. So where you would need the buffers on a box like this is you'd need one on the input, right? Where it comes in from the guitar. So get a buffer as soon as it connects here. Next buffer it would get would be on the amp, going back to the amp. That's your second buffer. The other buffer that you're going to need is on the return that's going into the effects return because a lot of the bu buffers and effects loops are just on the send, right? So buffers it coming into this thing, it hits your pedals. Now you're using the pedals as your line drivers because they're probably on if they're in the effects loop. And then return. We want to have it on the return because then we're not relying on that, that pedal, like the last pedal in your effects loop, just like the last pedal in your signal path going in front of the amp. You can't rely on that pedal to, to drive a 20 foot line back to your amplifier. So that's why you need one on the input, on the return, and on the main amp output. So you would want three in that case. I get best case scenario. Maybe in your effects loop it doesn't make that much of a difference. It's a line level. It's possible. But all things being equal, I would say use three. Um, this is from Jack. Laundry. Cool name. Uh, Boss TU2 first in the chain and a Boss FRV last in the chain. Okay for input and output buffers or should I get a dedicated buffer? Yes, you should. So when I talked about buffer specs, I mean, Boss pedals actually typically aren't just one buffer. So when you're talking about the FRV or talking about the TU2, sometimes there's actually multiple buffers inside of Boss pedals. So you're not just getting one, you're getting several when you go through one. And so not only does it amplify the noise in, in, in the noise floor of the entire rig, when you have a lot of those in series, it can be really obvious. It also attenuates the output a little bit, a few dB when you have multiples in series. Um, so you need to be really careful about that. The Boss TU2 does have a one meg input impedance. So that's a good thing, but the output is 1K. It probably is okay if you have another pedal on pretty soon after that all the time. But I would not want to use an FRV as an output buffer because that's going to be the longest line. When I say output buffer, I mean the last buffer before it goes back to your amp. You have the longest line in your entire signal path likely between the pedal board going back to the amp. So you want to go as low as you can at that point. So if you're really on a budget, I would say use the TU2 first and then go ahead and get something like this TC Bonafide. Use that at the end of the signal path. That's only $69.99. And then that will go back to the amplifier. That way you ensure the amplifier is getting a really nice low impedance signal. It's not going to be affected by the length of the cable coming out of the pedal board going back to the amp. That's what I would say. 
Um, would you use an input buffer after a reamp box? Uh, output impedance is 600 ohms. Yes. Yeah, I would. Um, and, you know, some of those reamp boxes, you could just get a good quality splitter and it'll actually have the impedance still be really low on the output and you can still get, you know, a, a line out of the, you know, guitar into a splitter. One side goes, um, you know, back to the, the board and the other side goes into the pedal board. And when I say board, I mean mixing board. And the other one will go to the to the pedals and that can ensure like the sur uh buffer is actually a really good one for that it has an isolation transformer you can split it out from the input there um could be a good way to do it um that that impedance is 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 pretty high uh 600 ohms i mean i, I would say not not terrible but it's it's higher compared to to the range that you want to try to stick to which is about 80 to 150. um I have a Zuma power supply and when my phone is close to my board when I play at church, it's noisy. What do you think it is? Well, I don't think it has anything to do with your Zuma. I think it has to do with your pedals or picking up, you know, a, a frequency from your phone. I mean, this is a pretty common thing. You know, you're, you're, you're sending and receiving data to your phone. This, this, is, this is something that is, is being picked up by the pedals. And, you know, ideally you wouldn't want to put your phone by your pedals. Most of the, most of the analog pedals in particular are not typically, you know, super well uh are super good at, at, at rejecting rf like that um and so you know sometimes it's a good idea to not put your phone right next to your pedals you can sometimes you can definitely get this to happen if you put uh, a cellular phone near a tube amp um that can definitely happen very commonly so i mean that's that's not something that uh th that's a that's a problem with your power supply it's it's, it's just you, you don't want to have your phone hanging out next to your power supply or your pedal board if you can help it uh, you're just increasing the probability that you could add some noise. So a lot of them aren't going to be filtered to get rid of that. Um, so I just, I'd be careful about that just in general. Um, how about if you already have pedals with buffers? I think we're referring back to the buffer conversation. It doesn't matter because most of your pedals with buffers, the buffers suck. Sorry to tell you. Most of them aren't going to be good. They're not going to be designed specifically to drive long lines. They're mostly just going to be replications of whatever the original circuit is that that particular builder is trying to emulate, let's say like a clone. Or if it's not in that case, they're typically not spending a lot of time trying to dedicate this buffer to being a really high quality line driver. I, I would be, I'm hard pressed to name one pedal that has a really high quality buffer in it. Usually the buffers and a lot of the older pedals were just designed to go from one pedal to the next. Well, there's Zeke. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's, it's like designed to, to, to drive a patch cable, but not really any long lengths of cable. So you just want to be careful when, when you think, oh, well, I have pedals that already have buffers. I can't think of one pedal that has a buffer where it's a really, really neutral, effective line driver that's going to do an excellent job at conditioning your entire pedal board. It just doesn't exist. Um, Jordan Y, what's your opinion on Gator case pedal boards and power supplies? Uh, I don't know, but if they're those ones where they're built into the pedal board, I'm pretty sure they're not isolated. So I would just be careful uh, with any of that stuff. Um, what do I think about the G&H low profile plugs? Well, I think they're okay if they're the soldered ones. I prefer to use the ones that are, uh, th that are from square plugs, the SPS4, the SPS5, the SP400, and the SP500. Those are the lowest profile ones and they're super well made. I've been using those now exclusively for probably about six months. Um, so really, really good. Uh, world's best cables on Amazon use Mogami. <laughs> Mogami is great. I mean, I still use that in almost everything. Uh, this is an interesting one. What do you think of the new Ernie Ball flat ribbon patch cables? I have tested them. I, I think that they're very low profile. I think if you're looking at it from the perspective of a rig building uh, standpoint, they're very difficult to dress well because you have to have them on their side in order to get them to loom really nicely. Now, if you don't care about the way that they look, that may not be a concern. The problem for me is I actually didn't like how the cable sounded, but that's a personal preference and not necessarily indicative of what you might think of them when you test them. I thought that they sounded a little dull uh, to me, like just like a little anemic. But again, that that is my you know my personal preference, and I prefer Mogami. I feel like it's a little bit more forward in the mids. I'm, and again, no cable is completely neutral. It's so it's almost impossible to get there. I just didn't like the way that they were EQ'd and what, how I tested it, just so you kind of have a sense, is I took, uh, I think I had eight of them and I put them into a Boss ES8 and I just looped them, you know, like send into return. So just took one cable out of the send and plugged that same cable into the return. And I turned on all the loops 
and I just listened to what it sounded like because I couldn't get one that was long enough to really evaluate it. And then I used a three foot instrument cable going into the input. I turned off all the buffers and I used a three foot instrument cable going out of the output. And so I could really test what it sounded like. I didn't have enough where I could get a three foot Ernie ball going into the amp. I only I used up all the ones that I had into the the loops. I just didn't like how it sounded as much as Mogami. That doesn't mean that it sounds bad. It sounds better than a heck of a lot of cables and I would way rather get that than a solderless cable for sure. Because I, I did disassemble them, and they appear to be soldered, as are the EBS uh, low-profile ones. So I think in that sense, if you were considering this over a soldered uh, or solderless connection, definitely get the Ernie Ball ones. The things I'd say are difficult. It's difficult to, to route them. You can't customize them. So for somebody like me, where you're trying to make every cable the length, it wouldn't really work. Um, and I just didn't prefer the tone to the Mogami. But again, if you're if you're if you're coming from a George L or you're coming from a solderless variety. You know, I would say it's a it's a better alternative than that uh, in terms of reliability. You know, some of the solderless cables can sound cool. I actually have some George L right here. Check out this. I have some George L here where I just soldered it, <laughs> and so I made you know a kind of like Eric Johnson style, where I have a Switchcraft silent plug to just a regular Switchcraft, and I just soldered the actual George L. It sounds cool. It's a pretty bright cable, but you know, like I said, cables are, are, are filters. So you can choose stuff like this if you want to exaggerate certain frequencies when you're plugging it into your pedal board. That's the place where the pedals or the cables are going to make the most difference sonically. Um, DIY Strymon bridges to fit more pedals. I, I don't think I can show you a DIY version of that because it would require that you had a metal fabrication facility in your house, and I just don't think that's realistic for most of us. Um, so I don't really have an easy way to show you that. Um, let's see. All right, it's going through a few. We've got a lot of good comments here. Oh, Josh Fowler saying he uses a CS6 and it's great. It's great supply. Uh, he's talking about one of the. It's it's sort of the the equivalent to this uh, Zuma R300. It's very similar profile, but it's made by True Tone. I, I actually also have one. They're great. Um, let's see. Guitar Brothers saying you may to check out Sweetwater guitar parts and cables. Very cool. Um, All right, I'm so close. First connection acts like a capacitor. Capacitance being the key word when you're talking about cable specs. Fairly close, though. You're almost there. Um, let's see. Let's see. Going there. We got a lot of good comments. John, thanks for all the tips and tricks you've been part of the last couple of years. My pleasure. Um, All right, Jordan Y. What's your opinion on Gator case that we talked about this one? Uh, yeah, I don't. I, if it's the ones that haven't built in, I, they're not great. I, I don't. I don't. I don't think it's. If it's the one I'm thinking of, I. I, I don't know though exactly which one you mean. Um, this is uh, Preet Parna. I need a buffer, but my pedal board is stereo. So uh, output, I'm going stereo, but the buffer has a mono output. Let me see. I need a buffer, but my pedal board is stereo. So for I'll put I'm going stereo, but the buffer has no. Uh, I think what you mean is you is is you only have a mono output for your buffer. So they they do have stereo buffers. Empress makes a good one, but if you had a mono buffer, you could just buy an individual second buffer. So let's say for example, this is a good good uh, good way to kind of think about it. Let's say I have a high wire, right? This has got a dual buffer. It's got one on the input and one on the output. So you have two buffers there that you can wire in the beginning and end of the chain. But let's say you have a stereo setup, right? This is only going to affect one amplifier at this point. 
So you would need a second output buffer. So if that was the case, what you would do is then you'd go get something like this TC electronic, and you would use that to go to the right output, let's say, and you'd have the left output going to the Mesa boogie, or you could get something like the stowaway that could go for your, your, uh, your second output buffer, or you could get something like the clear link, and that could be your second output buffer. So that way you'd have a, a separate buffer for the left and for the right. Uh, and then if you were concerned about any sort of ground noise, you could get an isolation transformer or some sort of uh, isolation box like we talked about with the Lely P-Split. Now this is a really expensive one. Radial also makes one that's a little bit cheaper than this that's kind of smaller that you could use for that application. So that could be a way that you could do that, have full control over your stereo system um, and be able to get the isolation, get able to get the dual or the tri-buffer in this situation. You have an input buffer, two output buffers, so tri-buffer situation. Um, Ryan Christie, how do you rate the buffers in the Mesa Boogie switch, crap, or switch track? I think it's the same output buffer section that's in the um, high wire. So good. They do a really nice job. Mario Marino is the designer of most of their stuff uh, as far as buffers. He's from Axis Electronics and it's kind of one of the first guys that put a really high quality commercial buffer on the market. So really, they're, they're all pretty excellent. Um, I have a question, do pedals that perform a complete ADDA generally still have low output impedance or they require a buffer after them? Some of them will have low impedance. Uh, it, it, sometimes it, it just depends though how they're, how they're doing it. You know, like there's some low impedance TLO72 uh, you know, buffers that are built around that op amp and that have output impedance as close to zero. but the TLO72 is, is still not uh, not a great line driver to do without any color. It can be a great chip to use for a distortion or an overdrive pedal, but it's not necessarily the ideal way to, to drive long lines. So it, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but most of the, uh, you know, most of the companies that design digital devices like Strymon and stuff like that, they publish their input and output specs. So you can kind of look on there and see if they fall within a range that you think is acceptable. And then you can listen to them and see if you feel like you're gaining anything if you put an output buffer after them or whether you just go straight out of the device itself. So that could be a test that you could do. Um, what's your favorite riff tune lately? Who's just killing it? Huh, who's killing it? I've been listening to a lot of uh, Doyle Bramhall's first record called Jelly Cream lately. Um, and uh, the song I've been listening to the most on that record is I Wanna Be. Um, and it's got some really, it's got a really cool solo section on it. And I think that album came out in, you know, maybe late 90s or early 2000s, something like that. So I wouldn't say it's a new thing, but uh, check out Jelly Cream, I Wanna Be. It's a really good one. Um, I think it's time to do another giveaway. So let's do the giveaway for the effects loop interface box. So in this video, this is going to be a tough one. In the video that I did for this, I talked about something that I did to the bottom of the enclosure to the countersinks of the screws. I want to know why I removed the paint from all the countersinks on the back of this enclosure. How come I remove with the Dremel tool all the paint on the enclosure before I reassembled it on the bottom plate here, those, those countersunk screw holes? How come I remove that paint? First person to answer that correctly is going to win this switchable interface that allows you to switch between an effects loop or in front of the amp with all of your mod and delay and over or mod delay and reverb pedals, not overdrive. So first person answers that, gets it. And then we'll have one more to give away after this. I'll do that at the end of the stream. All right, I'm gonna keep going with some questions here. Um, John Hurt, I have an old TC Electronics Chorus Flanger, great pedal. How do I integrate that into my pedal board without using a power strip? Well, if you have something like a Voodoo Lab, uh, pedal power too, you can use the courtesy output. The other thing you can do, which is a little trickier, I'm trying to see if I can show this to you in an easy way. One thing that I've done is I've taken like a true tone and where you have that LED right there, I, I cut out the LED because the LED is not doing anything circuit wise. And I bore out this hole a little bit more and I actually feed the AC cable through here. And then I solder it up to this piece right here and it has some solder lugs um, that are there. I think currently they're crimped. 
um, and you could solder onto those or you could remove the crimps and actually physically solder the wire on or you could get new crimps and recrimp what's there along with the TC electronic cable. Now, I'm not recommending you do this because um, it, it could be dangerous if you're not sure uh, if you know what you're doing, but that is one way that you could do it where you're basically turning this LED into another input, um, you know, into this or an, another output from the system rather. So it's coming out of the AC in the back and it's traveling to your TC chorus. That's one way to do it. Um, the other way to do it is <coughs> you could create a pass through box using like power con connectors. And, uh, and then you could have like a Y cable that comes into the back so it would split, you know, so you have like, it would be like one IEC that comes into two IECs. And so it would like plug into the back of like a small interface box, kind of like one, of, you know, smaller version of one of these guys where you have like an IEC connector or a power con connector on this end and on this end. So you'd have to convert the, the side uh, with the TC electronics to that style, or you could just keep it with, as a, whatever it is, two prong. I think it's two prong on that one. Um, Steve, or Stephen Cano, how do I make a custom link TRS cable? You have to just buy twisted pair shielded or mic cable, I mean, depending on whether it's carrying audio or not. Um, and uh, wire the tip to tip, ring to ring, and sleeve to sleeve. Basically like a regular guitar cable, you're just adding in the ring. Um, so, you know, just get uh, any sort of, like a Belden 8412 would work uh, for this purpose, especially if it's an audio related thing. Um, and uh, get some some uh, TRS quarter inch uh, plugs and you just wire the tip to tip. So it doesn't matter what you which uh, the center conductors you choose to be the tip as long as it matches on both sides. So you know you want to make white the tip. Just make sure it's white on the tip on both sides. It's black on the ring on both sides and the sides, and then the shield is the shield on both sides in the same place. As long as they're m matched up, then you, it's going to work. Um, Will I have to get two? Oh, okay. we already talked about this one. Okay, got that. Uh, here it is, Brent or, or Bent Rossum. How do you think the HX FX compares to pedals like the Strymon or Eventide pedals? Well, it, the HX FX ha has way more going on than than any of those. If if I had to choose one for a pedal board, obviously the HX FX is much more comprehensive. It's not necessarily uh, comparable. Um, I think more like the HX Stomp is probably more comparable to those, but I still think the HX Stomp it has some really cool a aspects to it that those can't do, like where you have all those options for amp simulation and cabinet simulation. I mean, Strymon has a cab sim on it on the Big Sky, but you have to you have to like that sound, and you don't have any ability to manipulate it or use impulse responses or anything like that. So I think that there's a lot more you can do with the with the Line 6 version. They all sound really good. I've been really impressed with all the sounds in it. That's why I'm kind of building this rig around it. But I, I have an Eventide H9. I'm using I'm going to use an H9 on my other rig. Um, uh, a lot of people really love Strymons. I'm not the guy to ask. I, I kind of just haven't liked the, what the Strymons do to the dry signal, so I don't usually use them for myself. But you know, I'm certainly in the minority in that in that case. A lot of people really like the those pedals. Um, but I think the HX stuff is really great. I've been really blown away and very impressed by it sonically and in terms of its functions, its ease of use, its editing software, really easy to use. Um, all right. Let's see. Big T guitars join halfway through, so behind. What do you think of bullet cables? Cured a lot of my hum issues. I don't. I don't know much about their cables, so I, I can't. I can't say. I mean, if the cables are well made, they're well made. Uh, you know, I would hope that they're they're soldered. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know the spe specifics on their on their actual cables. Uh, I haven't tried them. Um, okay, Jordan, we talked about that already. Um, Is that a Fender ML in the back? Yes. Where is it? Yeah, that one is a Fender ML. And I, I use that typically as a power amp for a wet dry situation, a real wet dry situation, not the the splitting thing that people are calling wet dry now. I don't know how that got started. Um could I use the courtesy app for a line six power supply? Yes. If you're talking about like a a, a pedal power two sort of thing. 
uh, I have an SDH one. It makes noise when turned on. I mean, that's sometimes gonna be bucket brigade, man. There's sometimes gonna be no no way around that, especially if it's a vintage uh, SDH one. Uh, I mean, if it's like making the huge oscillations and stuff like that, it, you may need to replace the chips. It could be that. It could just need to be serviced or calibrated. Um, I don't know if there's anything you could do DIY though on that thing to make it you know quiet, more quiet. They some they can sometimes be noisy. That that can be the the nature of, of a bucket brigade uh, chorus or delay. Um, let's see, Braxel, uh, if you run an H9 or any effect that are through two amps left and right, will they be stereo or dual mono? Um, well, it sounds like if you're running if you're running stereo through two amps for left and right, then they're going to be in stereo. Uh, if you were going to go mono, though, then I would I would create a separate set of presets that are panned to the left, um, so that you can leave them connected in stereo, but then just get the uh, the left signal only hard panned as the mono, because the summing thing that a lot of people do doesn't make sense. Like the idea of it to somebody who doesn't know about audio summing, in this case, it sounds like a great idea, but this is what you need to remember about a lot of the stereo pedals, is that left and right are not mixed 50% left, 50% right on a lot of them, especially with dimensional stuff. So they might be off like 40, 60, 70, 30. And then there's another caveat to that. A lot of times the right output will be inverted in the polarity. And so you'll have one side that's out of phase and one side that's in phase. And then you go into a mixer, somebody who's saying, okay, I'm gonna sum this, and they're mixing them back 50-50. So you have an out of phase 40-60 mix that's then being remixed at 50-50, and they're calling that your mono mix. It's gonna sound like garbage, but people who think or they don't understand that, they just say, oh, I got a mono sum, this is so great. You know, like everything's great now. I got a mono sum, but they actually don't even know what their mono reference is. They just are comparing it against what they think that it's supposed to sound like. If you actually compared it against the mono reference, it's actually not that close. And you actually get closer if you hard pan those pedals to fully left and create a bank of presets that are just for mono and another replica bank of presets that are for stereo because they really do sound much different. And unless you have pedals that for some reason are all mixed 50-50 in the left and right mix, and none of the, uh, or all the polarities are, are, are inverted, because it'd have to be across the board on all of them, or that none of them were inverted, then you might be able to get away with it more evenly. But, but most of the guys are not building active mixers from what I've seen, and then you have no adjustability on them. They're just fixed to a baseline that they've determined is whatever the, the natural place is that the mono mix is supposed to be. So I've never found them to be more valuable than just cre recreating presets for mono that didn't require any sort of summing. I've done it for people because they, they insisted on it, but the results were never there. It, it, it just It's a compromise no matter what way you look at it. Um, so I would just be careful about that. Um, let's see. All right, we're getting back to uh, to some buffer stuff. Let's, uh, Robert Jackson. What if I have an always on Klon style pedal after my wah? Is it a dedicated input buffer that is necessary at that point? Well, the buffer in a Klon is not a good buffer. The Klon is a good overdrive pedal. It's not a good, it's not a good buffer. It's just a good overdrive that happens to be buffered. So that doesn't make the buffer good, you know, correlation doesn't equal causation, right? So I don't think that this is something you should consider to be the epitome of buffers. It's the epitome of overdrive pedal. A lot of people love it. It's really great at what it does. Absolutely no doubt about that. As far as the ability to be an over or, or to be a buffer, not good at that. So you should still have a dedicated buffer um, if you can help it. Now, I don't remember what the Klon input impedance is, whether it's one meg or whether it's it's more loaded down than that. I, I forget what it is. Um, but, it, you know, it being after your, your wah pedal doesn't necessarily mean very much. Uh, your wah pedal it might be sensitive to buffers, which a lot of the vintage ones actually are. Um, 
And if you always had your clone on, you would at the very least, if you liked the way that, that sounded, you would at the very least want to have an output buffer. So something at the end of the chain that would drive the signal back to your amp. But as far as like a lot of people say, oh, I got a clone, so I don't need another buffer. Well, first of all, as soon as you turn on anything else after the clone, the clone buffer is done at that point forward. Any pedal you turn on is going to override any buffer that's come before that. Right, so that buffer is only going to be good until you turn on another pedal or another buffered pedal is in the signal path. And then that pedal is now the buffer from that point forward. So the benefits that the, the clone buffer is having in an overall system where you have a delay on or a reverb on all the time, plus the clone, the clone may be only buffering through a few pedals. And its ability to be able to isolate the guitar from the pedal board is minimal because it's not a high quality buffer, not a high quality line driver. It's a good overdrive. That's what it's built to do. Uh, has Alan, yes. So anywhere between 80 and 150 ohm output is, is, is ideal. For most cases, I mean, it's not, this is, this is a generalization, but in most cases it will be true. Um, <clears throat> I hear radio stations when I turn on the volume on my guitar with the fuzz phase. And that, that, can, be, that can be common. Uh, even if you're just using it by itself on a battery, does it still do that? Just guitar plugged into the fuzz, then now some of those old high gain uh, silicon transistors will uh, can can still get some of this stuff. But sometimes it can also be a function of of a grounding issue uh, or RF issue on the board. So that's why I say just try it independently with a with a, a battery powered and see if it uh, it still does that. Um, <clears throat> Okay, fuzzes and buffers. So if you, have a, if you have a fuzz, you don't want to use an input buffer. You can have the input buffer come after the fuzz, but anything that's impedance sensitive like that, like vintage treble boosters, fuzz faces, like you know any of the, the PNP, NPN stuff, a lot of that's gonna be sensitive. Tone benders, that, that stuff is all gonna be sensitive typically to an input buffer. So you would wanna put your input buffer following the fuzz. So then that way there's not any sensitivity that is going to be exhibited, um, you know, from from the device that's following the buffer. So, you know, guitar would plug into that because, like stuff like fuzz faces, it wants to see guitar directly. It really affects the sound if that doesn't happen. So, highly recommend that. Uh, Aaron, uh, thoughts on the gig rig grumpy bot buffer? I don't I don't know what it is. Grumpy bot buffer. I'll look it up. Grumpy bot buffer. Let's see. Grumpy bot buffer. I'm looking it up here. Let's see. Well, it doesn't have any specifications <laughs> on it at all. So it's hard for me to know uh, about it. I think one of the ones that I had here, I don't think it was that one. It had like a splitter. Uh, on it and I think that it was I think it had a 1 meg input which is good but had a 1k output which is about what's that so normal normal you'd want be, between 80 and about 150k and this was or 80 sorry 80 and 150 ohms this was 1k so that would what mean it's 10 times higher than what it was recommended so I don't know if this thing has the same uh, output impedance, but typically there's like little small guys. I haven't found any of them to, to be in that spec. And usually when people don't publish them, it's sort of bizarre that they wouldn't do that. Because if you understand what a buffer really does, that's sort of like the critical spec. And I've said this before, but it would be like advertising the safety features of your vehicle and then refusing to publish the crash test ratings. Like it just there aren't, there are two things that you just wouldn't do. And so it either means, you know, I'm not presuming what their what their intent was, but in a lot of cases, it usually means that either they don't understand that that's actually the bullseye of the target, and so they don't publish it, or it's not in the target, and they don't want to publish it because they know that it's not in that range. I don't know the reason, and maybe it's off on both uh, on on both um, points there in terms of what I said. But the only one that I've seen that's small that actually is really good uh, is made by Creation Audio Labs, not Creation audio company or I'm not sure what, what, the, what the other pedal board surface making company is but this is called Creation Audio Lab C-A-L they're out of uh, Nashville and he has like a little tiny discrete buffer 
that is in the spec. You have to ask him to lower the input impedance though, because he kind of makes them more toward a piezo. So it's super unloaded. Like it's like five megs or twenty megs or something like that. It's like a really high. I can't notice much difference between anything above five megs. It's pretty hard to hear the difference um, in terms of the imp input impedance being or uh, being that unloaded. Um, but if you just ask him to lower it to one meg, and I think he'll do that for you custom. He actually builds it into a jack, and you can just retrofit that into uh, an interface, or he can make it for you so that it's that's that it's like an input buffer, um, and you can just put them in the places in your interface box. If you were building, you know, using one of my templates, like for one of these guys, you could actually just install the jack, and it has the buffer built into it. So you can ask him. His name is Alex Welty, and uh, you can ask him to sort of customize these things for you. And uh, his are actually really cheap. I think that they're like. Fifty dollars for one, and you could just buy a couple of them and install them in the right place. I was actually thinking about doing a video with his stuff. I had asked him about it, and even showing you some options on how to wire in an isolation transformer for stereo purposes, um, because there's a, a good quality isolation transformer that I found that's made by a company called Triad, and they're about five dollars each, um, and it's not too tricky. But if I can get Alex to build those for us in the jacks, I think it'll just save people a lot of time. Um, so I can't answer too much about the Grumpy Bot. Um, I hope it's in that spec. Uh, and all I can speak to is the one that I saw that was like a splitter, and I forget the name of it. It had sort of a, a weird name like this, like you know, some, some sort of almost like a I don't know expression that an elderly person would use <laughs> to describe something. Um, let's see. Do a couple more, and then we'll go on to our last giveaway item for the day have you tried evident evidence solderless cables yes i have i think for solderless it's the best you can get but it's not comparable to a high quality soldered connection F for for less money in a soldered connection you'll get a better connection than you would from evidence uh, using the solderless the screw in solderless system i think the cable itself is very well made it has a very specific sound um, but the cable itself is actually very high quality. I just don't, I, I, I can scientifically prove to you and have scientifically proven that it is not a superior connection. It is not gas tight, um, which is the, the prerequisite for the highest quality connection that you can get. Solder is gas tight. It encapsulates the connection completely in leaded solder, presuming that you are using leaded solder. Um, and it is the best possible way to maintain the highest quality connection. That is why every pro that I can think of that has done rig building for any amount of time only uses solder, or soldered connections and not solderless connections. Um, when is the hinged option coming from Fix? So uh, he's talking about Fix is, is the company that is manufacturing the pedal boards for us. So, so Fix is actually going to be Vertex pedal board division now so they're going to be manufacturing distributing doing everything for the vertex pedal boards just like the the one that i showed you here which i'm going to be building on this week and i build my kind of john mayer inspired rig on this one that's uh, 10 by 20. and uh our goal between me and the and the owner tim is to get these out right around april um you know where a lot of businesses are offline right now and it hasn't stopped what we're doing um but you know, when they'll actually be available in stores. It might be delayed slightly just because a lot of people are closing down until April just to to try to mitigate any of the, the possible ramifications of uh, the, the COVID-19 stuff. So there may be a slight delay in when they actually will be arriving to stores, but as far as our production schedule, we're still on track for uh, about an April uh, timeline. Um, Paul St. Ed's, Uncle M, could you just demonstrate real fast how to solder a George L. Cable? Well, I mean, it's pretty much the same. Here's a George L. Cable that I soldered, and I just did this because, you know, I, I like Eric Johnson, and, you know, he saw he has a, a soldered one that goes on into the input of the system, although most of the stuff on the pedal board is all solderless. Um, it's tricky. You actually have to scrape away with an X-Acto knife all of the, the kind of the black insulator around the, the center conductor. The shield is pretty easy to separate, just like any, any sort of braided shield. Um, but you just have to cut away kind of like your mandolin slicing uh, that black stuff off. And then, you know, you just peel all of it back. It probably takes about 15 minutes to do it on both sides. And then you can just solder it like a normal cable. Um, I think that's the best I can say it. 
Uh, uh, Artie, I'm using uh, Ecamm to do this. Let's see. Uh, am I coming to GearFest? Uh, GearFest is what Sweetwater puts on every year. I am as long as it's not canceled. Um, let's see. I have a Boss MS3 using four cable method. method. So loop three is uh, the loop for this. Do I need four buffers? No, you just need three. So you need one on the guitar in. You need one on the return. And you need one on the main out that goes into the input of the amp. So three buffers there. Um, let's see. Audio Ventures, can you clip the foot switches off the circuit board, the PCB of a DL4 without desoldering them and install momentary switches? I'm trying to remember, I think on the DL4 there was just like little pads that have like a spring actuator um, that comes down. Can you just clip the foot switches? I don't think, I think the foot switches just have a spring on them. I don't think that they're soldered to anything. And, and I think that those, the little push button actuator just has like either a ribbon cable or two leads that go into the main PCB. So I think if you're using momentary switches, you just, you could just remove the old switches. I don't think there's any wires on those. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, and then you, you would just take the two wires from the momentary and then go into where the, the, the actuator button is, is, um, is feeding into the PCB. I think that that's, I haven't done one of those mods in a really long time. That's kind of vaguely what I remember. I'm sure there are some pictures of somebody who's done this mod on the inside. It's, it's basically just putting in your Carling momentary and then just putting two leads going into the PC board. I don't remember cutting out anything. Um, I just remember removing that spring loaded switch. Um, let's see. Any tips for DIY riser? You know, I mean, you could do them out of plywood, they're just kind of heavy. Um, you know, and you can adjust the height, stagger them individually. I mean, like, <sighs> fixed pedal boards makes like these guys, and they have them in different heights. So I think these are a three quarter inch, and then they have it in like one and a half inch and higher. Um, so you can get some of those, and, and they have different numbers on them. And so they're numbered like this is for like an MXR size, and then they have like larger ones for Boss or different size pedals. And they kind of have like a like a lookup table on their sites. So if you go to fixed pedal boards, you can check those out. Um, let's see, we'll take a few more, we'll do our last giveaway, and then uh, call it a night. Let's see. Uh, Al, Kuya Mason, it's a cousin in, in uh, Tagalog. Uh, will the HX stomp work the same way as the HX effects with the Morning Star? Yes. So you you just use the MIDI out of the of the HX uh, stomp, and let's see, and then it would go into the MIDI in of this, which is here, and then you would go to your five pedals. So you have your send and return for your five pedals, and then the in is here, the out is here, right? And I think there actually is, is there, I think there is one loop in the HX effects that you can put an external pedal into. If I'm wrong about that, then I would just put this before the HX effects. So like guitar would go into this and then out of this, it would go into the HX stomp. But if there is a loop, then I'd put this in the loop of the HX stomp. And then you would connect it through MIDI and then you could turn pedals on and off using the switches. So you might want to have, you know, one foot switch would be dedicated to the the processing in the HX effects, and then the other foot switch could be say an on and off to whatever the pedal is that you wanted to switch with the Morning Star. Um, so totally possible to do that. And then Morning Star also has their own uh, foot switch um, that you can you can bring it out to. I think it has six foot switches on it that you can assign to different things. And it could also work in conjunction with your um, HX stomps. So that could be another alternative where you control it from Morning Star's foot switch instead of using it uh, on the foot switches on your HX stomp. So that'd be another alternative. Um, 
What's the best solder to use? Uh, I like Kester 6040. If you look in the description, I have a, a recommended materials and parts list, and it's in there. Um, and uh, I think that that's I think that's about it. So <clears throat> this is the very last item for the giveaway, which is a uh, a five jack version of the the uh, interface. And I'm actually going to publish specs so you can drill this out yourself. This is cool because you can use this as for stereo, you can use this for mono, you can use this for effects loop, you can use it for a lot of different things. So basically whoever wins this today, uh, you're gonna get in touch with us, you're gonna get in touch with Mejia uh, in the comments section, he's gonna have you email him. And uh, we're going to uh, build this however you want. So you just tell me if you want it to be mono, you want it to be stereo, what, what you want these five jacks to do. And I will wire it, if I don't lose it first, I will wire it in accordance to what your desire is and ship this to you free of charge. So my very last question is, my very last question is, and we've had this question come up a few times today. If you have a stereo system, you have a stereo pedal board, how many buffers do you need ideally if you have a stereo pedal board? First person to answer correctly gets it. So I'll wait on that person over the first is to answer. <laughs> if you have a stereo pedal board, how many buffers do you need, ideally, for a stereo pedal board? First person to answer that correctly will get this. For a stereo pedal board. It looks like Bryant Portales got it first, three. So why does he need three? You need one on the input, right? The guitar hits that one first. Go through all your stereo effects, and then you know you have a left and a right out, so you need one buffer that's dedicated to the left, one buffer that is dedicated to the right. So it's three. Now, if you had an effects loop in stereo, then you would need a fourth. But we were just talking about a regular stereo setup. If you had a buffered, uh, if you had a stereo setup, you would just need an extra one on a return. So you'd have one on the input, this is talking about now a stereo with with two amps with effects if you have input you have one on the input you'd have one on the output which would be going to the the, the main amp the first amp and then you would have one going to the return of the second amp so you'd have yes yeah, so let's see one input output yeah you have four total because when you're doing stereo effects loops you typically don't run into the front of both amps you usually will just run into the input of one amp and then you'll run into the return of the second amp uh, for the, the stereo output because you'll have send coming into the board back into the stereo effects and then you go out of the stereo effects you go left let's say into the the main amp return and then right into the the right amp return you won't use the uh, both sides of the effects loop on the uh, stereo amp um, so thank you everybody. We did uh, an hour and 35 minutes here and I hope that you got a lot of good information. Again, everything that we, we talked about today from buffers to power supplies to DC power cables to patch cables, everything's linked. Uh, again, if you don't have a Sweetwater sales engineer, uh, you can go to their website and you can request one right from their website. And I've actually put the contact page here and you can just write to them and they are actually, you know, they're, they're sort of like, for lack of a better word, they're like your uh, the sonic midwives, you know, the tonal midwives. They're helping you give birth to your tone, and they will curate for you the very items that you need. And again, I've been there, done a lot of training with many of the sales engineers, so many of them are familiar with this exact same stuff that we've been talking about, and they've been trained by me in some intensives that we've done there, so they know a lot about this sort of stuff. And, you know, they're really, really great people, very, very easy to work with. So I highly recommend that you check those out. All the links, again, what we talked about today are in the description. You can always ask me questions in the description uh, or in the comments section, rather, and I can get to you the best that I can. Um, again, and I'm sorry if I didn't get to every single person. Um, Mason Mejia is going to be reaching out to the winners, um, and so we will get in touch with you. Um, if he hasn't already reached out to you already so that uh, we can get you those items. Again, I'm shipping these to those winners free of charge. 
and uh, I will make sure that uh, we get those out to you before the end of the week so you guys can have those to play with. I'm going to try to do as many live streams as possible while we have all this downtime here. I'm going to be working you know, exclusively from home, presumably, for the next two weeks. And uh, I will try to bring you as much good quality content as I can during that time and as many videos as I can during that time. So I really appreciate your viewership. If you haven't subscribed, please make sure that you subscribe to our channel. That way you just get all the latest and greatest updates um, and make sure that you hit the bell icon. A lot of people don't realize that YouTube typically is only you know, sending you about maybe 20% of the total stuff that we put out there. So if you want to make sure that you're always notified when we go live, when we come out with new content, have, hitting the bell icon and then setting it to all so you get all the notifications. Just make sure you stay most up to date. So I really, really appreciate everybody who participated today. I really appreciate that uh, we had so many great comments today. You know, it looks like we got hundreds in here, which is great for us. Um, so thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. And uh, thank you all for uh, the happy birthday wishes. I really appreciate that. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again a little bit later this week.